Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade, Max Wilbert. This episode of The Green Flame is a set of deeply personal stories and ruminations on permaculture experiences, ethics, and practices between two radical environmental activists. We are so grateful to Soulbound for permission to share their original song, Seeds, and their cover of an old rainbow hippie gathering song, Pacamama, as part of this broadcast. Soulbound, that's S-O-L-E-B-O-U-N-D, can be found on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash S-O-L-E-B-O-U-N-D-M-U-S-I-C, Soulbound Music forward slash. Soulbound can also be found at Bandcamp at Soulbound, S-O-L-E-B-O-U-N-D dot bandcamp.com forward slash releases. Boris reads a short passage from the book Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants during this episode. We thank the author, Robin Wall Kimmer, for braiding sweetgrass. And now, a radical permaculture episode of the Green Flame. We begin with music. Before us, 
it's true that you can be the change you want to see Start small, begin close in your community Let's return to the days that have long gone by To the days that have long gone by And that plastic will be a distant memory Framed on the wall in a museum People will be ashamed to see it Cause we are the seeds of tomorrow And we are the rivers of today Let them flow through our veins like our grandmother's okay Boris, it's really great that we get to have a conversation here on the Green Flame for the first time. We're going to be focusing on permaculture, although in our communities as radicals, it's been interesting forever. Lots of people are interested in permaculture. Could you explain kind of how you became involved in permaculture? Yes, sure. So in my 20s, I was a diligent student of architecture and later regional science, spatial planning. But... Somehow this culture has been very confusing to me from the beginning and nothing really made sense. So there's a nice quote by Derek. He always says that uh, his 20s were horrible because the science and the symbols of this culture didn't make any sense to him. And I can totally relate to that. So I felt the same. So I, I uh, always ask myself how can we destroy nature and the whole world so massively and still most people are only interested in finding a decent job and live a boring uh, conformist life within the system and also i had some expectations from parts of my family uh, they had some expectations on me like finding a decent job make a good career etc so i felt a lot of pressure and Somehow I was uh, intuitively always seeking for alternatives and I was always all, uh, very interested in uh, indigenous people. But sure, this is no alternative for us, or at least the culture tells us that this is no alternative. And when I discovered permaculture, it appealed to me a lot because it finally offered a real alternative, another way of life and a way out of this mess of this weird mess this 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 culture is and so i have two i think two main interests um originally two main topics that that for that i think permaculture is great um so i was at some point in my 20s very dissatisfied with the food that i can buy in the supermarkets I had a very good friend, he was from Georgia, not the uh, American state, but the uh, country in the Caucasian region, which brought us to Russia. And he came to Germany to study and he said, oh, I got to know him and he said that, oh, the, the German food is so, is so electric, you know, it's, it's so artificial, it tastes like electric to him already. So he made a joke and... I didn't really understand what he means, but then uh, we became good friends and I visited him. He invo invited me to Georgia and I visited Georgia and his family. And the country was 2003, pretty um, in a bad condition after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, because it has been part of the Soviet Union. And there was all kinds of corruption, poverty and whatever and problems. But the food was so great there. It was so fresh, you know, and so local, fresh local produce and very cheap. And so this was when I understood that this system they still had of relatively small scale agriculture or, or horticulture 
and gardening is is just great in a way because it produces so good food so they the people they have a quality of life that we in the west or in germany at least we don't even understand anymore and so uh, i just wanted to have better food so the second thing is food sovereignty so i had an understanding for a long quite a while that this culture is not sustainable and that it's this way or another will lead to a collapse and i was curious why people in such a short period of time can give up give up much so much of their food sovereignty so we are nowadays so completely dependent on uh, the supermarket system and how to get back to the soviet union so people were not starving after the collapse or at least only very very few probably in uh, in countries like georgia and also russia because they still had everybody had a grandmother living in a village nearby who grew a lot of food on on their own they were uh, self sufficient still so they could go there and get a lot of good food and i i wish we would have this for the collapse of industrial civilization but we don't another story my husband of my mother he is um more than 20 years older than my mother so uh, he was 12 years old when 1945 the second world war ended and i was very interested about that time also because my concerns about food security i i asked him what did you eat so how did you get along did you starve or how was your life and he said it was quite okay my grandmother had a plot of land we as a family and the big very big garden and we had about 30 chickens and we had a potato field and my grandmother was growing all kinds of vegetables and she was also preserving them for the winter she always did that that's what just what people did at that time and of course they had a few rations from our dear american friends but that was not uh, the main uh, food source so they still had a traditional food system and that's amazing. I love the yeah. way that the grandmothers are, are, are showing up in your stories. Yes, wow. because they, they carried all the knowledge. And now, um, you know, um, when I start as a young permaculture interested uh, man and um, I want to start my self-sufficient food system, I don't have any traditional knowledge. So my, so my, my own grandmother doesn't know any of this she's already too young i had to learn everything from scratch had to make all my mistakes all my trial and error and yeah but another point is that the industrialization of farming really kicked in after the world war ii but this is another topic we can probably talk about later so so this is the stories that i wanted to share thank you boris i'm going to go ahead and answer that question too about how I became interested in permaculture. And my path's a little bit different than yours. Yours is absolutely fascinating. I have had a community around me, a progressive community, kind of a leftist community, of course, um, that's been talking about permaculture for as, I can remember for most of my adult life, so it was always there in the background someplace for at least as long as permaculture has been around because there are instructors here that have been instructing for about 30 years. And so at the same time that I was CSA, um, Community Supported Agriculture Farming and Market Gardening, I discovered through some reading, and I believe that it was reading about Wes Jackson's research into perennial grains, that agriculture destroys land and biological communities. And I was, I was, that was one of the first times that my world got flipped upside down and I thought, well, there we go. I love growing plants. I love my relationship with plants and I love doing this. Um, what's the way that I can continue to do this in an ethical way? And there was permaculture. It's like there's a whole different way to build a relationship with plant communities. And it's great because this has been a passion of mine since I was a kid. So... At the same time that I was doing my permaculture introduction course, I had also read, End, read Endgame, and I was being 
introduced a radical um, analysis, anti-civ analysis. So my permaculture course that I took for a year as an introduction was sandwiched between two DGR workshops, two deep green resistance workshops. And so there was no way that I was going to be able to go into a permaculture class and not radicalize it. It, it just kind of happened automatically, and I was absolutely fascinated as I was studying permaculture by in, invisible structures. That was where I wanted to go with how do you design invisible structures that make sense? How does this apply to society? How does it apply to community? Where most of my classmates weren't applying things radically. They were looking at how they're going to design their own little space and ignoring the systems of oppression that for me, um, we have to confront. I mean, the very first ethic is care for earth. And I couldn't understand why every permaculturist wasn't a radical politically. Because if you're going to care for earth, then you can't tolerate capitalism. You cannot tolerate um, human supremacism. It, that's not the way the world is. That is not, not, not the way that you take care of earth. So that's a little bit about how I uh, became interested in permaculture and why it was automatically a radical um, design process for me. Um, and to harken back to what you were saying, too, about grandmothers is I was raised and my mother was still making soap and we were still growing food. That's where I got my initial love of land and plants was because it was all there. Some of those traditions and some of those um, community sustaining and life sustaining traditions that that create that good food and that good relationship and that self-sufficiency were there as part of my childhood and it could have continued as part of the culture that that I'm in with my family and the way that you know I, I store food the way that I interact with land the way that I plant and have that urge to plant every spring and to follow the cycle of the seasons so that's it for me about how I became interested in permaculture thank you for your stories Thank you so much, Jennifer. It's very interesting. And um, about the group that you were taking when you took the course, uh, I have a very similar experience. So I, I was telling uh, so how I became interested in permaculture, but I didn't tell uh, how the story continued. So, and uh, linking to your story that you just told, I can tell you know, that I also. Um, became part of a group, so I was looking for a permaculture course and I found an introductory course and I have found some people who who were organizing permaculture courses and I became part of the group and we later on we even found a non-profit organization to uh, promote permaculture and education and try to be uh, to uh, promote a better, more sustainable way of life and so on. And we did some good, some great things for a while. So there was a woman who was really uh, great in education and in educating people, I mean, and she was also working in that field. So had a, she had a lot of connections and we did great projects in schools, uh, building uh, gardens and planting vegetables with the school children. That was all wonderful. But as the same as you, it was exactly the time when I got into uh, Derek Jensen's work and there was all this endless talk about the ethics and earth care and so on. And I, I couldn't stop to make more radical comments. So I want to tell a few examples here. So I think my interaction with permaculture culture people really uh, helped me understand how liberals think. So there was a teacher, he said that he asked, so what is wrong with all the young people being so critical nowadays? Because we have all the freedoms we want. And I thought, okay, this is somehow weird. Because what does he mean by freedom when, when uh, the oceans are filled with plastic and the whole life-supporting systems of our planet are being destroyed? So I, I, I'm asking myself, so what, what about the freedom of having breathable air? What about the freedom of having a livable planet, and what about the freedom of having a future? He obviously didn't think about that. Absolutely. And later, 
and later he he said something very interesting to me and also um how can i say um it made me angry in a way so he said that he believes that once a human population meets the 10 billion people we will become and we will stop uh, our population growth and we will become the consciousness of planet earth thanks to internet technology everybody loved this note so everybody was totally excited and said, oh so great we're gonna be the consciousness of planet earth and so on i was younger a lot a lot younger than i'm now so i, I it took me a while to understand what he what he was up to with this and at that time i was just uh, very confused i thought how can he how can he make such a prediction and then i understood later i i thought a lot about his his statements and i understood that this is just purely random the notion of 10 billion is just his fantasy and the consciousness of planet earth he he thinks we will become uh, is just uh, another um way of the old um humans as the crown of creation uh, story you know and i also thought later that he as a permaculturalist as a person supposed to be very close to nature he should understand that actually it's the it's the water it's the trees it's the bird song it's cricket song it's all of the communication that is happening in nature which is actually the consciousness of planet earth so um, we as a culture have numbed ourselves to this language and he he was just a technocrat he didn't understand any of that this so this was one example and but i still tried to to radicalize people and i showed i showed at one meeting i showed them um a talk by derek jensen and in a way they were also they were all impressed but after that one woman said that um she believes that mother earth is cleaning herself in a very painful process and i thought okay <laughs> How deep in denial can you probably be to to make such a statement? And another woman said that she believes that when the gray glaciers melt, they will relieve a lot of ancient wisdom for humanity. Mm. So you can see where this is going. I still worked with them for a while, but at some point the whole group fell apart and I was most of the time on a board of directors I did all, uh, most of the work and I was at some point just exhausted but I because I understood they, they are not going the path that I want to go so they are not activists they want just to have their convenient lives and they were all middle class had a good um, good life and money and everything they just wanted to have their individualist lifestyle a little bit more sustainable and they wanted to talk a lot to talk so most of what we did as a organization was meet and talk and not not action on the ground or anything like this that's fascinating um i, I had a similar experience too when i went into all fired up i was all fired up and um, ask some really pointed questions at the very beginning of the course about what does this mean to to Earth? I mean, how does how does this you know? And and, and pointed out the fact that we've got global warming, we've got all these you know, what are we what are we going to do about this? And I was shut down immediately, saying you got to keep things positive here. <laughs> so, yes. Got to keep things positive here. And then I got pretty quiet, and I found a couple of people within the course who said yeah you're absolutely right about this so i had a couple of people to talk to but pervasively in the culture itself it was like keep it positive keep it peppy um and and i encountered or encounter a lot of human supremacism too that this is all about us and some of the things stories that you told there are just so appalling and so blind to um to all of our fellow creatures which I think is the only way that you can really have a chance of going anywhere as a community if your community is bigger than just the human community, because what you're talking about there sounds pretty crazy <laughs> um, yes. and, and very much a dead end. So what did you do after that? 
Yeah, as I said, the group fall apart somehow. And um, for a while, I was still teaching in a in an in introductory course in a um, adult education school. Like we have this. Um, it's called uh, People's University, where you can take, take all any kind of courses, like knitting, cooking, whatever. And they also wanted to offer permaculture, which was, which was nice. And they hired me. And I, I made a few courses, but I also got so tired of this because they were all this idealistic middle class people and, and also conformists and not, and the, the payment was not so good. So I just, I, I decided I will not waste any more energy on them. And as a member of DGR, I think um, if there are some people more radical and also interested in permaculture, they will find me this or that way. So I don't I don't want to waste my energy teaching to this kind of middle class people who just don't care, want want uh, a better, more sustainable lifestyle for themselves. Because maybe this is a good point to go to to go uh, to the ethics now. As you said, you know, earth care would mean stopping all the destructive destructive activities immediately and starting restoring natural communities immediately i couldn't agree more i mean what else could you possibly do with that yeah it means stopping capitalism mm -hmm. and and people care means basic human rights for everybody fair distribution of wealth also stopping capitalism. Um, and I'd like to say something about that too. I mean, for me, people care definitely means sane communities that are fully integrated with the land upon which they live. That is, for most of our history, for most of the existence of people, that's that's the way that, that we have automatically been. So for people care, for me, isn't just about individual rights, like hearkening back to what this guy, we have all the rights that we could possibly want. What are you worried about? Wasn't that basically what he said? No, we don't have all the community that we could possibly essentially need, human and non-human together on the land. So for me, people care means community, community, community. And then with the last one, which is also share the surplus, um, is also fair share, right? Yes. It's also mm -hmm. put that way sometimes. Uh, that, in my investigations of what a sane human community would look like, permaculture principles pop up everywhere because they're the ones that sustain life, the ethics and the principles sustain life. And I'm looking into matriarchal societal structures and they do gift economy. And gift economy means no more capitalism. Your economy is based on the circulation of gifts and the meeting of needs, not wants. Yes, absolutely. And it's just absolutely brilliant. So it's like I got disillusioned with permaculture, but now everywhere I look, I go, wait a minute, that's an ethic of permaculture. That's a permaculture principle popping up in all of these places that, that are life-sustaining or, or societal structures that are life-sustaining. So that's what I wanted to add to that one. Did you want to add some more about the ethics themselves, Boris? I get really enthusiastic uh, about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, I totally agree with you. Fair share was, I think, uh, I read it in the original um, copy that I had of um, Bill Mollison's manual. It, were, it read, setting limits to population and consumption and not fair share. And I found this interesting. I think they, um, fair share or redistribution became um, more popular later because um, Western people don't like the notion of setting limits to anything, their population or consumption. But of course, it will be important in the future to set limits to whatever we do, to our, our consumption especially. I'm really, really glad that you brought that up because that is also... Those are two really different concepts, and both of them, I think, essential. And I also think that it points to the idea that, that permaculture itself is a dynamic, evolving process that is that, that, that has a lot of diversity within it. 
I don't know if that's an accurate observation, but wow, what a difference between the original and what happened shortly thereafter. And what an incredible nod to to both schools of thought about that that third principle. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say some more about setting those limits? Because I was following the later train of thought and... and Yes, I think I would like to explain a little more why we should set, uh, set limits. And the reason why we should set limits is that we already have broken the limits of the planet. And I, I want to explain why. So I said that the industrialization of farming kicked in after World War II. And there's a great quote by Vandana Shiva. She says that, we are still eating the leftovers of World War II. And I think it's very, very important that we as permaculturalists and we in general uh, understand food chains. Uh, but I will get, get back to that later. Um, but I want to tell the story of industrial agriculture very short, shortly to, to explain the, uh, the importance for setting limits. In the 20th century, uh, we had uh, the first and the second world war, so the most, the largest wars that ever happened. A very important man whose inventions shaped our recent history was Fritz Haber, um, because he developed the process of ammonia synthesis, and ammonium nitrate is the basic material for explosives. So he volunteered. Um, for the First World War and, and worked in the German War Ministry on the synthesis of war chemicals. And his research made him later the father of gas war. He developed chemical weapons that were successfully used in the First World War. And he was very much celebrated for that, while his wife uh, didn't like his invention so much and took her life. So she committed suicide. Anyway, so after World War II, the industrial manufacturing of ammonium nitrate, so the process that Fritz Haber actually invented, became a common standard to produce ammunition and explosives that, was used, that were used in World War II. So also um, the Allied forces uh, produced, used this, this um, method to produce their ammunition and explosives. So after World War II, many countries were sitting on large stocks of ammonium nitrate and they were thinking, so what can we do with all of this? And also we cannot shut down all this uh, industry because we will lose all the jobs. So they, they thought about how they can um, transform this industry to something else. And so it happens that ammonium nitrate is a excellent source of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers and the the pesticides are based on toxic gases that have been developed for war so the chemical fertilizer and pesticide industry was created as a result of a political effort to convert a war machine for peaceful purposes so fritz haber's inventions indeed broke the planetary boundaries by artificially producing more nitrogen than there would be naturally. And this was the birth of modern agriculture. And we can say that industrial agriculture is literally waging a war against the land because it's using the chemical weapons that have been developed for war. And additionally, there were other innovations in agriculture, hybrid breeds and um, factory farming, and the general um, massive use of heavy ma machinery in agriculture. But agriculture was already a war that was being waged on the planet and is probably the single most destructive thing humans have ever done to Earth. So this just accelerated the war? Absolutely, yes. So they, you could say they invented new weapons first uh, for actual war, humans against humans, and later they just used them to make their war or their exploitation of uh, the soil and the, the earth more efficient, if you want to say. But 
as I said, they broke the planetary boundaries and all these processes are very, um, very, they consume a lot of uh, fossil fuels. So as soon as the fossil fuels get scarce, we cannot uh, continue this way. And during this time, when agriculture got more and more efficient in feeding more and more people, uh, the human population also raised up from about 2 billion, I think, up to almost 8 billion. And so this can obviously not continue. So I want permaculture also to be something like an emergency plan to address coming food crises. They will come sooner or later, this or that way, because industrial agriculture is not sustainable. It will collapse at some point and then it cannot feed 8 billion people. And nobody knows if permaculture can feed 8 billion people, but at least we should try to, to set up systems that can feed as many people as possible in a sustainable way. I, I'm very curious now about uh, the people who created permaculture and if they were intentionally putting together a whole alternative for food production as well as, you know, the design process itself that creates relationships and sustains life in reaction in part to the horrible acceleration of the war. Yeah, I think they did. Um, as I know from Bill Mollison, he lived in uh, Tasmania. And he lived just at that time when so he was of British descent. And so first the British came in at the end of the 19th century, 1800 something, and they waged uh, genocide on the native population. And, and some um, decades after that, Bill Mollison was born. And of course, he was aware of that, that he lived on a on a land that has seen the genocide of its um, uh, original population. But also he saw uh, industrial agriculture coming. And he saw that that uh, Tasmania was quite, quite um, a natural paradise still. And he saw how destructive this industrial agriculture is with big, big um, tractors and all this machinery and then uh, with industrial uh, chemicals, fertilizer and so on. So how, how it destroyed his home, basically. And then he, he wanted to find alternatives. So this is the story that I know of him. I know from my experience with the introduction to permaculture that there is serious respects paid to different cultures and to different practices and to indigenous knowledge in the course materials that I encountered. And one of our primary instructors um, is very, very, very respectful of even introducing permaculture to any indigenous people. I remember her stories going to Africa and making sure that she had something to teach because she had a lot to learn as well. So that is fruitful ground for for um, advancing a lot of ideas. I started out with permaculture too, and then I went into another introduction to forest gardens, which I think is is another step into deep relationship. So it's constantly evolving, and, and the respect is there for different kinds of knowledge, for your grandmothers, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did you have anything that you wanted to add about that history? Because it's really important to understand that we cannot keep on waging, that, that we cannot keep on eating the fruits of this war. It, it won't last. It's based on fossil fuels and it's destroying the soil. And the soil is everything. The Absolutely. health of the soil is everything. That's where all of our life comes from. Yes. So in my utopian vision of the future, uh, a shift to a more sustainable society would be actually not very difficult. You stop all the all the subsidies that conventional farmers get and give the money to those who build topsoil, who have that knowledge and engage in, in practices that build topsoil. And sooner or later, the future has to be 
an age of ecological restoration because otherwise we don't have we don't have any future at all so at some point we have to understand this so either societies as a whole will understand it or individual people will build lifeboats and times will be much harder i see a very few examples i recently watch a documentary about China and of course they're doing all all kinds of destructive uh, industrial activities but they are also very pragmatic and they had to do a barrier to the Gobi desert they had just had no other chance because there's sandstorms coming uh, to China all the time so they planted plenty plenty of trees so gigantic forests so China is actually the country that plants the most for uh, the most trees in the world. So um, and so at first they planted monocultures, but later they understood that it's not good. It's not so. They are many of them are dying. So they uh, started to plant more diverse systems. So this is a little hope. I mean that humans. At some point, they just can be very pragmatic. If it works, if, if they have no other chance, they probably will do ecological restoration. That's really interesting because I was going to circle back on the, the encounter that I had with Wes Jackson and his research into perennial grains as being the moment at which I understood that agriculture was incredibly destructive. And his work is about trying to find... Um, perennial grains on the prairie that can restore the soil and build soil at the same time that you feed the people. So once, you know, here, here we are again, you know, you're talking about give all the, the funding to those who are growing topsoil. Um, give, give back to the species of plants and animals that grow soil and and do it in a way that that continues to create more and more abundance it's not just forests it's it's wherever your biologic community is and what it needs yeah i also thought about uh, food chains and you know there there has been research about the comparison of um, conventional beef or bison meat or something like this so I, I don't know, I cannot do all the math, but I think if you would re what to say, if you would reintroduce about sixty million American bison, you could have a great food source and very sustainable food source. I don't know how much meat you could take off out of this and probably factor farming is much more. But the quality, the health of this meat is so much better. And the same is true for all animals, for also for chickens. So if you have the factory farmed chicken eggs, they are so bad quality and compared to the ones that free range and eat whatever they like and have a great life. I would like to see it go even farther and build relationships with animals that, that can take care of themselves and become independent once again. I know that, that you introduce turkeys on the little place that, that you inhabit because they could stand up to the predators, right? And when it be right. picked off by the hawks, they can take care of themselves better. What, hap what would happen if you, if you took away the private property and took down the fences and let the buffalo roam again in the natural migratory herds? You know, there's one last shred of buff buffalo wisdom left in Yellowstone Park, in, in one wild herd left. What if the fences came down and how much health and how good would your relationship then be? We can we can push this a long way out. <laughs> a long sure. way out. So this, this would all be part of the coming age of restoration that I dream of. That we in, reinvent uh, large ruminants, large herds of ruminants into the land because we just have to to fight climate change and to rehabilitate the land. There's no other way. And we have to restore our relationships with our kin. Yes, 
We have Otherwise, to. Otherwise, we are perpetually at war. We, we can't do this anymore. I mean, this is a soul-sucking, soul-sucking existence that we're stuck in, and this is not the way it must be. <laughs> no, not at all. You're so right. And maybe this is a good uh, time to read a little bit from uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Please do. Learning the grammar of animacy. To be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. I come here to listen, to nestle in the curve of the roots, in the soft hollow of pine needles, to lean my bones against the column of white pine, to turn off the voice in my head until I can hear the voices outside it, the shh of wind in the needles, water trickling over rock, nuthatch tapping, chipmunks dig digging, beech nut falling, mosquito in my ear, and something more, something that is not me, for which we have no language, the words, the wordless being of others, in which we are never alone. After the drumbeat of my mother's heart, this was my first language. I could spend a whole day listening, and a whole night, and in the morning, without my hearing it, there might be a mushroom that was not there the night before, creamy white, pushed up from the pine needle duff, out of dark to light, still glistening with the fluids of its passage. Poo poo wee. And then she talks about the word poo poo wee, which is um, the, the first language of the tribe she is part of. And let me find a phrase. Um, yeah, my first taste of the missing language was the word pupoi on my tongue. I stumbled upon it in a book by the Anishinaabe ethnobotanist K.Y.D. No Kwai in a treatise on the traditional uses of fungi by our people. Pupoi, she explained, translates as the force which causes mushrooms to push up from the earth overnight. So I think this is absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Boris. That's that was a brilliant way to end the the conversation that we've just had. The beginning, maybe, of a couple of conversations. I would think. I think that we could move from here into a lot of stories about the different permaculture design principles. But perhaps this should be the first permaculture presentation that we make in the green flame. What do you think? Yes, I agree. There yes. will be many more, I guess. Boris and I went on to conclude our discussion with this Skillshare opportunity based on the permaculture principle, observe and interact. Yeah. Here's an idea that I had. Like I said, you know, when I bumped into the ethics, it was just like care for earth. And then I was just like, done. <laughs> you do that and everything else follows. And it's mm -hmm. kind of the same way with the design principles. The first one, observe. You mean observe and interact? Yeah. Comes up all over the place. All over the place. All the time. No matter if, if, it's, a, if it's worth learning. Yeah, what what were you what what was your first introduction to how to practice that? Um, just come into a place mm. and sit there many times and uh, listen and look at what you see and uh, see who's who else is there, what kind of plants, what kind of trees, what kind of animals what kind of noises you hear, and so on. See who lives here. See who's um, on the land that you probably going to inhabit. <laughs> and uh, think about how you can um, interact with them, how you can probably get closer to them, but 
you should never um, apply any force because mm -hmm. they will, they will come sooner or later because they are very curious. The way that it was introduced to me in class was they were definitely talking about designing, you know, your own place or your own space or your own property, you know, your own little private place. Yeah. But what they said, don't do anything. Do not start. Do not start for the first full year until you've watched for a whole season. You've gone through all the seasons with that land and, and you've 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 sat with your land for a whole year. And the only exception that they made to that that I remember in the permaculture course that I was part of was plant trees because they take so long to grow. But other than that, don't do a thing. Just sit there and watch. I think it's part of the long process, maybe the first step in the long process of becoming, trying to become indigenous again. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of, of building relationships that have yes. meaning. To, to start, just to start listening, because mm -hmm. we Westerners, we don't listen. No. No, and yeah. we project our preconceptions all the time. It, you have to become fully present. It's a meditative process, isn't it? Yes. In a lot of ways. Yes. It's a spiritual process. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's a joy. <laughs> It's a total joy, yes, absolutely.
We will be back with part two of Radicalizing Permaculture. On the next installation, we'll base our discussion on permaculture principles. Thank you for listening. This is Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.